start with go live here. Okay. So as we're just waiting for a few more people, I'll try to answer that. So okay. So the Gentiles were the non-Jewish, the non-Jewish people. So they would have been the Canaanites, Philistines, um, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, um, all, all the Romans, the Greeks. All of them were Gentile. When you, as as we go on and read on, um, this was Israel as as it was when when Joshua led them into the conquest. So later, after after Solomon, there was a divide in the kingdom. So Solomon, David ruled, uh, Saul, David, then Solomon. Then after Solomon, Solomon's son, um, uh, Rehoboam, I think it was, he followed the advice of his friends instead of the advice of his fathers. Um, his fathers. His father's advisor said, your father taxed people too heavily. Your father, you know, there was too much stress on the people. Take away the taxes, lessen them, and so on. Rehoboam didn't listen. His friends said, no, tax them more. You're the king now. You deserve it. So he listened to them. And the northern kingdoms, all of these from Dan, uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, all of these kingdoms said, we don't want to... We don't want to follow Solomon, so they divided, and they followed a. They made King Jeroboam. Um, so you now had what became known as. Uh, let's see. It would have been. Although no, that's more in Ephraim. It would have been like this. So you had the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. So the northern kingdom pretty much did not follow God at all because Jeroboam was afraid. Remember, God said, you always come to where I set up my, my presence, the place of my presence, which was Jerusalem, which was smack in the middle of the southern kingdom. So Jeroboam said, I don't want that. If my people every year have to keep going down to Jerusalem, they're eventually going to say that's too much and they'll rejoin with the southern kingdom. So he set up, um, I believe Samaria is somewhere around here. He set up a, a temple and an altar in Samaria so the people of the northern kingdom could, could offer sacrifices there. However, it ended up the northern kingdom continuously sacrificed to false gods. So... As a result, God sent his punishment as he promised. The Babylonians and the Assyrians came down and carried off the northern kingdoms into captivity. However, and then later the Babylonians came down and carried off the southern kingdom because they also rebelled against God. They had idols in the temple and so on. When that happened, the last of the Babylonian kings, when he took the people of the southern kingdom, or this became known of as Judah and or yeah, Judah and Israel. So when he took Judah into captivity, what he did was he said, I don't want there were some people that were left, not all of them were taken captive. So there were a partial people that were left, and he took all of the peoples that were still living that weren't Jews in there, and he scattered them among the Jews and forced them to intermarry. So when they intermarried, they became known of later after the Jews came back from captivity. Now you have this intermarried group of people that are part Gentile, part Jew, and the purebred Jews that are coming back from captivity, these intermarried ones became later known of as the Samaritans because most of where they lived was in that area of Samaria. And it, it was caused by the king of Babylon in order to, whoever was left here, he didn't want to allow any purebreds to be left because they would band together and try to take, try to overthrow his rule. So what he did was he intermarried them, therefore making them a little weaker. In, you know, we're no longer purebred. 
So, and that's where the Samaritans came from. So the Samaritans were part Jew, but they were intermarried and intermingled with Gentile, which is why the Jews despised them. So they, they were they were not purebred. So the woman, the Samaritan woman, is she is Jewish? She was she was part Jewish. There was Jewish blood in her, mm -hmm. but she wasn't pure Jew. Okay. So and that's why she asked the question that she did of Jesus. Who is right? Your people say that we worship God in Jerusalem, but we say we worship him in the mountains because the Samaritans still kind of had their worship in around the city of Samaria, which is where Jeroboam had set up his, his altar and so on. So that's the difference between them. So the Gentiles were absolutely not a drop of Jewish blood in them. The Samaritans were a mixed breed. Okay? Thank you. And that, that's actually a really good question. That's an important question to understand the whole gospel of John chapter 4. If you don't understand what the, what the Samaritans were, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So that's a good question. Okay. That was a little pre-introduction just to wait till people got here. Okay. We will get back to that shortly. Okay, so let us get started. Um, again, continue to be in prayer for the uh, for the retreat. Um, we are now up to fifty. Hello. <laughs> Um, we're now up to about 50, 57 people, Ooh. and possibly 58, a whole lot more than I was expecting. So continue to be in prayer for that. Um, I will be sending out emails for the next couple weeks, just some suggestions and things to prepare, um, to begin preparing for what, uh, for what the Lord has for us there. So um, just be in prayer for that. There's a lot going on. Please be in prayer for the Lord to keep good weather that weekend. <laughs> I don't care if it's cold as long as there's no snow. Um, so um, if, uh, if you haven't finished the full payment, as soon as you can get that to me, that would be great. Um, hopefully, I believe the latest I would get. I need to have it by would be the uh, second week of February. Again, I'm trying to lessen how much time we have to spend in the arrival. So if we have all that collected, we'll be able to jump right into what the Lord has for us. Um, Dottie, I think you probably see Judy more than we do. Can you print those emails off and give them to her? Um. My, my email is... Oh, your email is messed up. Okay, we'll have to get someone to print them for you, too. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'll try to remember. Unless I gave you my work email. Uh, that, that would be if, fine as well. You know, if it doesn't kick you out for security purposes. But yeah. Um, I'll, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I get that. Uh, okay. I, I'm, my wife can remind me. I'll print a couple copies for people who aren't getting them. Um, on email. Okay. 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 Um, Anything else? Okay. Yeah, change the date. Oh, no, it, it's the dates are showing up in the, yeah, it's the 21st or the 23rd. There, there were a few people who got an old version of the uh, registration form that wasn't corrected, but the one online was correct. I did check that. I had the correct dates on it. Okay. Um... Okay, let's get started with a word of prayer. Then. <laughs> so Lord, we just come into your presence tonight, and we want to thank you for the privilege of being able to pull ourselves apart and just give time to sit in your presence and learn from your word and hear from you of what you expect of us, your people. And Lord, I just ask that that you would just teach us tonight. 
teach us your heart. Teach us your desires. Holy Spirit, come and open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits to everything that you have for us. And teach us the will of Father. Convict us of the areas of our lives that we need to change to align to our king and to his kingdom and to his desires that he can have all that he is so worthy of. And Lord, I just ask that as, as we study tonight, as we look at your word, that Lord, you would just remove every spirit that would try to distract, that would try to mock, that would try to pull us away from, from truly concentrating on all that you have for us. And Lord, I just ask that you continue to mold us and make us from your word. I ask that your word would get into our very being and, and would just burn with the fire, that living fire to burn out of us everything that is not of you and to, to feed everything that is you in us, that we would become more and more like you and that we would represent you, our King, before our world the way that you're worthy to be represented. And Lord, I just ask that you just be glorified in everything that is said and everything that is done here tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are finishing up the book of Joshua tonight. Um, so last week, I believe... We read through Joshua 23. Did we get that far? 22, 22. Okay. I believe it was... I should mark it, but we'll start with 23. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, um, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> if, if that was me, I would have had to pray the Lord to <laughs> make me respond in a Christian like way. <laughs> okay. So last week we had looked at the final conquest of the land and the division up of the, the dividing up of that land, how that was divided up among the Israelites. And we're just going to pull that up. Uh, can I go? Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay. So. After the conquests were done, the area in pink was all the territory of the land that had been conquered. And one of the last acts that Joshua did was to divide that land up by each of the tribes. So, and if you weren't here last week, let me know if you did not receive that handout. Um, you can keep your hand up, and, and if you can just make sure everybody didn't get one of those. Um, so, and these are all these maps are in there. Again, um, maps are very important when it comes to Bible study because it gives you a context of the land and the territory at the time when the things took place. Because the land and the territory, though it's still the same place geologically. Um, geographically today, it has changed and the boundaries are different. Um, different countries own different places now. But this is what it was like back in, in the day of Joshua. So each of the tribes received their, their portion from the Lord. Uh, and then they set up the uh, cities of refuge. Remember, they had six cities um, that they had set up evenly throughout the land so that if anybody unintentionally uh, killed somebody, they'd have a place they could go to be rescued and taken care of until the, um, they were able to be tried for that. 
And then they also gave out cities to the Levites. And though we didn't read all the cities, um, we did make note that the Levites were actually put in charge of the, um, do we need another one of those? Uh, I may need my daughter to make another one of those. Uh, yeah, I, I have you corrected email. Uh, yes, she actually does. So, um, so the, the Levites were actually put in charge of the city of refuge, all, all six of them. They were part of the cities that they were given. So after, after they had finished um, conquering the land, Joshua dismissed the uh, Reuben Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh to be able to return to, the, to their lands on the other side, on the west side of the Jordan. And you remember that is where we left off at the end of 22. Um, when they crossed over Jordan, they built an altar. And the people of Israel got upset. They came out because why are you building an altar already against the altar that God had there? And because God said, do not build any other altar. You only have the altar that is in the place where I choose for my presence to dwell. So those three tribes said, this is not an altar of sacrifice. This is an altar of memorial. It is a witness against you all over here that later in the years to come, your generate your your um, the people coming after you will not be able to say we you we do not belong to Israel. We're setting this up as a witness between you and us that we are still a part of you. We do not plan to offer any kind of sacrifice on here. We plan to still come to Israel, but to ensure that we have safe passage to the altar of the Lord. We're setting this altar up as a memorial and as a witness between us. And that satisfied the, uh, the people of Israel so they didn't wipe them off the face of the map. Um, so they, they all returned home. They returned home to their lands. And then Joshua instructed them to go out and spy out the lands. And be, they were now told to... Conquer what was left. So you have the area in pink behind here that was conquered, but all of that other area for those tribes still needed to be conquered. And so Joshua had instructed them, you know, settle in your lands, get yourself settled, but remember to conquer the rest of that land. So one of the things we're, we're starting to get into now, I told uh, those who were here, what is this now? Our, Third. This is our third or fourth year in the chronological Bible study. Third year. Those who started three years ago, I said this was chronological. And the only thing you saw at that point was when we jumped to Job in the middle of Genesis. Well, now we're going to start getting into the chronological part of the Old Testament. And we're going to be doing a lot of jumping around because though it's written in a particular narrative, the narrative doesn't follow the chronology. So um, you'll, you'll see us starting to jump around tonight. And as we go forward, we're going to be all over the place, fitting scriptures where they actually happened in time instead of where they occur in the narrative. And that's helpful because it gives you a better understanding of what that story was about. When you understand the events that were going on at the time of the story, what God's trying to show you actually makes a lot more sense. And hermeneutically, that's the correct way to interpret the passage of Scripture. That's the historical setting. So, we now are up to, and I'm going to leave this, uh, no, I don't need to leave this up right now. We'll come back to that. Okay, so now we're up to chapter 23. <laughs> Ch 
chapter 23, verse 1. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given rest from all of their enemies around them, Joshua, by then old and well advanced in years, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in years. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all the nations for your sake. It was the Lord your, uh, your God who fought for you. Remember how I allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land the of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the great sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will drive them out uh, of your way. He will push them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. So Joshua calls Israel together for his farewell speech. He's old, he knows he's dying, and he wants to address the nation as a whole one more time. And as he addresses the nation, he reminds them of all the Lord had done for them. And he says, now, as you, are, as you are here in the land, you remember I told you that the Lord was going to drive out the people. You're in there because the Lord fought for you. Notice Joshua didn't claim any of that, any of that victory of his own doing. Joshua made it clear. What you have today is yours because God gave it to you. And it's important that we remind ourselves of that, of everything that we do. It's easy, it's so easy to come to a place where we're well settled, things are going smoothly, and we begin to think, oh, look what I've done. I've done this on my own. And... We have to understand we wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for God, grace, and God giving it to us. God, God didn't just say, you know, here, he didn't snap his fingers and all the Canaanites and Amorites and Kivites and so on were dead. He said, here's your land. You fight. I'm going to fight for you, but you have to go to the battle. And it's the same with us. God gives us promises. God gives us uh, uh, he leads us and guides us in where he's going to take us. And he says, now, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to fight for you. It's going to come out from my hand. But you've got to go to the battle. You've got to go there and be there. And Joshua reminds them of this. And then he says, verse 6, Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. <laughs> Notice what he emphasizes. Obey the law of the Lord. Honor the Lord your God, and serve only Him. Again, if you, if you don't look at the Old Testament from the perspective of God as the eternal king setting up His rule and reign on earth, some of this just looks like a bunch of legalism. Moses gave you a law, now follow it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And that's not at all what, what Joshua was saying. Joshua is saying, God has sworn to be your king. He has sworn to you and made a covenant with you to be your king, to be your God, and you are to be his people. Now be sure to honor that covenant. Honor your part of that covenant, and your part of the covenant is to obey the law of your king and to not reject him and turn to the other gods of the nations. And in fact, don't even associate with them. <clears throat> verse 9 the Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations to this day no one has been able to withstand you one of you routs a thousand because the Lord fights for you just as he promised so be very careful to love the Lord your God now 
again, I, I want us to catch the context of that because that's one of those verses that gets thrown out in a lot of meetings. The Lord said, one of you will round a thousand. Well, context. <laughs> Joshua said, remember, you're not as powerful as many of these nations these nation states that you just conquered in these cities. God drove them out for you. God was with you, and when God was with you, one of you were able to fight a thousand of them. It was not something they did on their own. And we often, I've often heard that verse thrown out and says, one of you will round a thousand, but notice what Joshua says. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you. You can go out and try to fight whatever battle you want. If it's not the battle that the Lord wants you to fight, you're fighting without the Lord, and one of you is going to get routed by half of them. Okay? It's important to catch that context of that verse. If you are obeying the Lord, if you are seeking the heart of the Lord, if you hear what the Lord is telling you and you go out and you do it according to the way the Lord says, God will fight for you and he will be so powerful on your side, it is as though you can stand against a thousand people and conquer them. Why? Not because you're great and good and powerful, but because God is on your side. And God is only on your side when you're obeying him and doing what he told you to do. When you're doing it in your own understanding, and I got the battle scars to prove what happened with that. <laughs> okay? Always what the Lord is telling you. Verse 12. But, in in, but if you turn away and ally, and ally yourself with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them, again, that's a very pertinent question. I didn't realize that was going to come here. <laughs> and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. So the Lord says, if you become unequally yoked with the people that remain. And remember, God said, I'm not going to drive all of them out because you can't handle the full care and maintenance of this land. It's too big for you right now. But as you grow, you need to grow, conquer, and move out. In other <clears throat> words, this should sound very, very familiar. Because what are we told in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? When we accept Jesus as our Lord and bow our knee to him as Lord, he comes and lives in us. But there's still a whole lot of us that's still alive and living. Why? Because this new spirit man alive with Christ isn't strong enough to deal with all of the flesh yet. So what does God do? He grows us. And as we grow... What are we expected to do? Just let the Less flesh us. hang around? No. No. We're, not, we're supposed to ignore the flesh. Don't pay attention to it. Don't intermingle with it. And when you're strong enough, kill it off so that you, the new man, the new, the life of Christ in you, can grow and fill up that space. But don't, don't intermingle with that old man. You see, God, God's way of doing things has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. What he did with the natural Israel, he's doing with the spiritual part of his kingdom, the church, with that one new man. In us, he wants us to conquer the same way. We spend that time with him in the area that he gave us, and that's why so many people grow so quickly when they're first born again, because it's all about Jesus. They keep Jesus in the center of everything. God is everything to them. But then they mature in their Christianity, not in their faith, 
and they realize that, you know, this Jesus thing is, you know, we don't need to be so spiritual about everything. There's more practical things, and we begin to, okay, do you, I mean, if you're like me, do you hear how stupid it really sounds, and yet this is how we hear Christians talk all the time. And we begin to intermix with our flesh and our common sense, and we don't grow. And we wonder why we don't have the blessing of God on us. Because God said, you intermarry with that which is not of me. I'm no longer going to fight for you. If you want God to fight for you and give you victory, you need to become more focused on him and the spirit and let him strengthen you so you can put to death the flesh and he has more of in you to allow the fullness of himself to grow and, and live. <laughs> Now, verse 14, I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as every good promise of the Lord your God has come true, so the Lord will bring on you all the evil he has threatened until he has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go to serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Now, we don't like that. <laughs> That's why many, many people in the church today don't study the Old Testament. Because they say God has, that was the Old Testament. That's the way God worked then. He's the same God. Hebrews says that he never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did with Israel is how he works with us. And yes, we can, we can be assured when God gives us a promise, every promise he's given us will be fulfilled. And it will be good. Now, it may take a little more time than we expected. The people of Israel were promised 45 years earlier that they would be given that land. They left Egypt with that promise and then ended up wandering the wilderness for 40 years. And then finally coming up and took five to six years to have to conquer all that land. And that's the time setting that we're in. Now they're at a place where they can say God has fulfilled all his promises. Although the people who left Israel, only those of age 20 and less, actually saw the full fulfillment of it. Anybody 20 years and older had been killed in the wilderness. Yeah, um, can you explain a little bit to me about verse 17 right here? That he, he said he goes, he goes, all the good things that will pass, but like right here I'm trying to... It, understand where it says so shall the Lord bring upon you all the evil things mm -hmm. until he hath destroyed you off this good land which he hath given you remember back in Deuteronomy yeah. um, Moses told the Israelites you are to stand on either side of um, the mountain one half of you on Mount Gerizim half on Mount <coughs> Ebal and you are to speak back and forth to each other the blessings and the curses and Joshua was reminding them they did that when they came in the land Joshua was reminding of that God has right now, you are receiving all of the blessing of the Lord because you've obeyed him, you've followed him, and God has brought all that blessing. However, he says, don't take that for granted. Your God gave you a blessing, but he is a holy God, and he demands obedience. If you disobey him, just in the same way that he brought all the blessings on you, be assured he will bring all the curses upon you, and he will rip you out of this land completely. See, we take, and Joshua's just simply warning the people of Israel, God's people, what we need to be warned of today. This is why there's warnings even in the New Testament. Teachers are warned in the New Testament. You be careful because if you make one of these little ones fall, you, it'd be better if you just go and tie a little stone around your neck and cast yourself into the deepest of the ocean. Because anybody who leads one of God's little ones astray, Jesus says, there is nothing that awaits you but outer darkness. And he's not talking to an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. He's talking to a believer. Mm -hmm. 
This is a person who's a believer who is a teacher of God's people. That's a warning. In other words, you obey God, you do everything God is telling you, you will walk in absolute blessing. And God will fulfill every promise that he's given you. But if you do not obey the Lord, God will come at you with all the curses that come to those who do not obey his word. The little one, that's a, just a generic term for any age. Yes, a, a, any anyone. Right. I, I always think of it this way. When you're as old as God, everyone's a little one. <laughs> <laughs> He's the ancient of days, so <laughs> Judy's just a little one to him. <laughs> I think Judy's probably one of the older ones in the class. So Five years old. <laughs> That's okay. In God's eyes, you're still very young. <laughs> but this is, this is what's important for us to understand. God is a jealous God, and he's jealous for his glory. He's jealous over us, yes, but why is he jealous over us? Because we are the ones who love him and adore him and from whom he receives all that he has longed for since the moment he decided to create. And so he's jealous over us. We are his people. However, the thing he's most jealous over is his own glory, his reputation, everything about himself. And he guards it with... with <laughs> he guards it with great tenacity. And even if his own children defile his glory, he will react against his own children. Okay? And Joshua's trying to remind the people, you're in blessing right now, but the way to maintain and hold on to blessing is obedience. Don't turn from the Lord your God. And we're entering into a time period where if we will set ourselves apart, if we will learn to give ourselves and devote ourselves to the Lord and hear from him and obey him, we will walk in great blessing. And the prophets have been saying this over and over since the beginning of the Hebrew year back, uh, I guess it was last October was Rosh Hashanah. This is the year where God is going to begin pouring out his blessings. And, and throughout this next decade, we're, we have a great potential of walking in great blessing of the Lord. However, never take God's blessing for granted. The way you maintain blessing is by humble obedience to the one who is your Lord. And again, that's why, to be honest, I was pushing very hard to get this retreat from the first week in January because I just really felt that it would be important to start this year out bringing ourselves into the presence of the Lord and learning how to walk in the Spirit so that as we progress in what the Lord has for us, you know, we're doing it. And But the Lord had other plans, so I believe this weekend is just as uh, inspired by Him. Um, but that's why we're, we're doing it in the beginning of the year. Because some people, I heard somebody say, why would you choose the middle of February to have a retreat? Eh, good question. It's the worst time of winter. Because it's important we have this in the beginning of the year. It's time for us as the church to grow up and be what we are. Not just who we are, mm -hmm. but what we are. We are a spiritual people. And it's time for us to start living in the, stop living in the natural and start living in the spiritual as who we are so that we can maintain the blessing that God wants to give us. God has been working in many of us to bring our character up to the place where we can bear the burden of that blessing. Because I tell you, the blessing of the Lord is great, but the blessing of the Lord carries a great burden with it. And you have to have the character to be able to bear the burden. But you also need to have the, the ability to maintain the blessing. And we have to teach that. Remember, what, what did Jesus tell the Israelites? When you come into the land, take this law, you obey it, and teach it to your children, who will teach it to their children, who will teach it to their children, 
not just as a law, but as the law of their Lord, so they will obey it. Why? Because it, it, is, it is a law throughout history that by third generation, the blessings that came to the family, the good things that came to the family are usually lost. And you can go back in history and see it. First generation ran into great fortune. They built it up. They got it going. They maintained it. Second generation maintained. Third generation by that point took it for granted. It was gone. You can look in, into the history of ministries within the church where um, it was passed down to family members in one particular family. By the time it gets to that third generation, it's gone. Even where it wasn't passed down to a particular natural family member, it was passed to a member of the spiritual family, third generation, if there was not something to maintain that relationship with the Lord, to hear the Lord, and to keep doing what the Lord says, that ministry pretty much lost its power by the third generation. Now, it may have continued on for four, five, six, seven generations, but it has never had the same power it did in that first generation. It's very important to understand why the Lord said, teach this to your children and to your children's children, because God wants to keep that fire alive. There, there's a great fire of his spirit that only gets fed as we spend that time with him and as we, we breed and, and grow in, in the spiritual part of us. And if we don't teach our children to do that, Everything that we've worked so hard with the Lord to make, to get for our families will be lost. And we don't want to see that. So, uh, chapter 24. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before the Lord. <laughs> Remember, Shechem is where they had set up the, the tabernacle. And Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his sons went to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there. And I brought you out. And when I, uh, when I brought you, your fathers, out of Egypt, they came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. Now, not God's grace and his mercy. Not once in this summary narrative did God ever talk about the sin of the people. And you know from the study we've had, all through that little summary paragraph, the people rebelled against God and rebelled against God. And why did they live for a long time in the desert? Because they rebelled against God. And God never, God doesn't say here, oh, because of your rebellion, you spent 40 years trudging through the desert. He just says, you remember, we did this, we did this, and then you lived a long time in the desert. And, and even, again, God never says or writes something without a purpose. Mm -hmm. And when I first read this and when I was listening to it again um, on Bible Gateway, it just struck me. This is what God does with our sin. He sets it as far as the east is from the west. He buries it. He doesn't look at it. He rewrites our history so that when he comes back and looks at the history of Israel to recount it to them, what does he say? Now, mind you, this wasn't under the blood yet but God still reacts the same way he looks through he looks over the history of the people and he says okay we did this we left you we got you out of Egypt and you saw what I did to the Egyptians and then you lived a long time in the desert it's as though they never sinned 
that's how God deals with us. And it's, it's, really, it's really important to catch that. Mm. When God forgives, he forgives utterly. Yes. And he forgets. Can I just comment? Um, we as Christians, when we deal with people, let's learn, and I have to learn this, to look beyond the person and see how God looks at me, the finished product. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I didn't always, I wasn't always like that. Most of us aren't. <laughs> but if we look at it from God's perspective, once they're saved, even if they're not perfect, we got to look beyond that mm -hmm. the way God sees them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's those who offend us. Again, I, I brought this up for five years, you know, ad nauseum. But those who hurt us and offend us, we need to look at them the way God does, as though it didn't happen. Because honestly, if you're looking at the offense all the time, the only person that's hurt by it is you. You're sitting there and you're taking this thing called sin and offense. Every time you see that person, you're taking that knife of offense and going, oh, oh, they hurt me, they hurt me, they hurt me. They're not getting hurt. You are. How foolish is it? I mean, honestly, to hold on to offenses and grudges is to be the biggest fool that ever walked on the face of the earth. Let it go. It, 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 God already did, and that, that really infuriates some people. Because we like the God of justice that brings avenge, avenge, avenges me on others. But my God, yes, will bring justice, but in the way that he sees justice. And sometimes the justice of God is the salvation of the person because who really hurt you wasn't the person. It was the enemy of your soul that would love to take both you and that person into the, into the pits oh, and the fiery um, lake with him. So God gets justice by snatching out of the hand both of you. The greatest justice and vengeance that God could bring to any believer for any hurt that was ever done them is that Satan goes to hell without a human soul. Oh, praise God. That's the greatest vengeance that could ever come. And if we start looking at it that way, we'll be a lot happier. Okay? Uh, verse 8. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king, uh, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Now, that's an interesting statement, and for those who were here, you remember what we talked about. Balaam was a prophet of Yahweh, but Balaam was a prophet for hire. So when the king wanted to curse Israel, Balaam, who was a Midianite, and if you remember, Moses' father-in-law Jethro was a Midianite, and he was also a priest of Yahweh of Jehovah. So some of the Midianites, there was a background in, in and a time when the Midianites actually did worship Jehovah, and so they knew about him. Balaam was a prophet who at times would listen to Jehovah when it profited him. So Balaam goes, Balaam goes to curse, and God says, I wouldn't listen to Balaam. Which tells me, again, as you piece the story together from things that God says, when Balaam went to curse Israel, he went to curse them in the name of the God that he thought he was serving. And so he was trying to curse them in the name of Jehovah. And Jehovah said, I wasn't going to listen to him. And this is important because I know people who are terrified. And I, I'm the last person to in any way belittle the concept of being cursed by other people. 
but we also cannot allow the curses of the enemy and the curses of the enemies of God to frighten us. And this is, this is a verse that gives us that kind of hope. They may try to curse us, and yes, you may be cursed, and you have to learn how to break those curses off. That's just part of living in the battle and the war that we're in. However, understand the reason we can break those curses off is because our God will not listen to the curses of those who serve the enemy. If God would listen to those curses, then God's the one cursing you. And that's never going to get broken off. And we know that God will curse his people. He, we just read that in Deuteronomy. You obey me, blessing, blessing, blessing. You disobey me, cursing, 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 cursing. And the curse doesn't come from outside, it comes from God. And the curses of God can't be broken other than to repent and return and, and do what he told you to do. Balaam, God said, I wouldn't listen to him. Understand, you know, God's not going to listen to the curses of the enemy. You can break them because God is on your side. Uh, verse 11, then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Gershites, uh, Hittites, Gershites, Gergeshites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. Now remember, just to get this back, Joshua is being prophetic here. He's heard from the Lord, and he says, you know, back in verse 2, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you. <coughs> so when you see this I, understand it's God talking and not Joshua. Mm -hmm. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do, you did not do it in your own, with your own sword and bow. So I gave you the land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. You lived in them, or you live in them, and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. God said, remember, I did it. I drove them out before you. You didn't do this on your own. And notice he stresses that. With your own sword and spear. I did it for you. <clears throat> Verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Now notice we're supposed to love the Lord our God. But what does Josh what does the Lord say to the people through Joshua? Understanding all that I've done, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. In other words, understand who it, who your God is. He's not some big teddy bear Santa Claus vending machine in the sky that just wants to bless you all the time. And this is where this is where a lot of teaching within the church goes so very bad. We see God as the blessing machine. And he wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. No, God is a God to be feared. And if we do not understand who our God is, we're going to be worshiping the wrong God. And much of the church has set up a God that has become an idol that is not the God of the Bible. And that's one of the reasons I believe in this next decade we're going to see the Lord fighting against a large portion of the church. Because he... He has been very tolerant, and enough is enough. It's time for the church to become pure and holy, living in the fear of their God, the God of the Old Testament, who has never changed, is still the God of the New Testament. Now fear the Lord and serve him with faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers, that your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in those lands you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, that's a great passage and we love it. But do you hear what Joshua is saying to the people of Israel? 
And, and notice, he, he reminds them. Abraham and Terah were idol worshipers from Ur of Chaldees. Remember that. And from the Ur of Chaldees, I called them out, and I led them down here, and they left their idols. Now they came up to Haran. And remember when Isaac, when, when the servant was sent to find the bride for Isaac, was it, the, no, it wasn't, no, it was Leah. When Jacob went to find his wife, he went back to Haran where his mother Sarah's family was from, and he lived there, and he ended up with two wives because his uncle tricked him. <laughs> and Leah, his first wife, when they left, took the gods of her father, the Tephilim. They were little, the Tephilim were little idols of, of the gods of that area. She took them and she hid them. Rachel took them? Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Thank you. See, that's why I like a room full of Bereans. You keep me straight. <laughs> because my mind and memory doesn't work as well as it used to, so I need help. And see, this is this is what the whole this is what the body of Christ is about. This is why when you get one person in the front doing all the talking with no input, with no response, with nobody else talking. You get the whole body going down the wrong path. Because everybody's just eating up what they say. They must be saying that they got the path. they're the pastor, they got the degree, they got the theological education. What do I know? I had the theological education. I've been studying the Bible for years, and I know I get it wrong frequently. So I appreciate when you all say, no, no, you're wrong. Okay? We need that. That's what keeps us in check. That's why we that's why God didn't make the body as one big one big mouth and a whole bunch of little tiny body parts. Okay, the mouth, notice how small of an area of the whole body the mouth makes. Okay, the rest of the body keeps the mouth in check. And that's important. We got to get back to that. Uh, how about the Hindu converts that accepted the Lord and left all the idols uh, behind? That's what they. That's what they. That's what God wants us to do. What, uh, what happens when they see them again in the temple when you visit them? Well, again, notice, notice, and this is what I wanted to point out. Notice what what uh, Joshua is saying. He says in verse fourteen, "Throw away the gods of your forefathers." Mm. Now, Rachel had brought those gods with her back. But they went to Egypt, and, they, and, and some of the Israelites served the Egyptian gods because he says, and the, God, the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt. So he's referring to the fact some of the Israelites, while living in Egypt, became tolerant of the Egyptian gods and began to worship them. And so when God led them out, he now brings it, he's in the promised land, and he says, now, throw away the gods. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have any of those gods. Well, you don't necessarily have any of the statues, but Joshua is calling them to an understanding of their heart. And he's saying, in your heart, there is still a tendency to serve those gods to serve the gods of the nations, to serve the gods of the world. Choose today who you're going to serve. This is a heart issue that he's addressing. He's not, he's not accusing the Israelites of pairing idols, because quite frankly, if any of them would have had idols with them, as, we, as you saw with um, Achan, they would have never been able to conquer the land the way they did. God wouldn't have been with them. So there were no idols, but God is dealing with a heart issue. And God is saying through Joshua, okay, check your heart out. And this is important because we get really self-righteous as Christians. 
we get to the point where, well, I, I'm, I'm serving the Lord and I'm doing this ministry and I'm going to church every week and I do this and I do that and I help the poor and blah, 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 ad infinitum, ad nauseum of all the good things that we do. And yet God challenges us in our heart. And he says, check your heart. Where is your heart at? If you, see another, if you see a foreign God, if you see a God that is not me, will you tolerate that or will you reject that? And when it comes to our Hindu convert friends and converts from any false religion, that's a choice they, they make. And they're confronted with it any time they're with their family when they go to a temple. And quite honestly, every one of us I've gone to the temples. I take people around in order to show them the reality of idolatry and just how subtle and how powerful that is. And when you get into the times where those people are in the middle of their worship, it is, it is at times spellbinding as you're standing there watching. You know, like I said to, to in the spiritual warfare class, I've been in a temple where they're doing the worship of the idols, and the idols look alive. They look huge. And when I turned around after I'm outside the door and look back, they're no bigger than this. But during that time of worship, they were huge. And it gets very, we, we took a group of people up to the temple in uh, uh, Bridgewater, and we happened to get there right when the priests were finishing up the morning art view. When they opened that curtain for that god, the people were in, they were in awe. They were just, the look on their face was literally as though God showed up in their midst. And they were, they were adoring this idol. And you could feel it with every part of your being. And to say, oh, how foolish those people are to worship. You know, yes, they are. And God in Isaiah taunts the nations for their idols. It's stone. It's not even alive. But when you're in the midst of that and you, you get in the center of all of that demonic activity, your flesh rises up within you and makes you almost feel as though that is real. And I'm talking even if you're a believer. You can feel, you can feel the pull that they have towards that. And you have to be firm in your understanding this is not God. You know, it, it, it's the enemy that is against us is very powerful. And if we are fully concentrating in everything in the natural realm, we can get caught up in it. Now you say, well, I, I don't necessarily go to church all the time, but, you know, I don't worship idols. Well, do you tolerate them in your presence? Does it, does it sicken you? in the very core of your spirit when you see somebody bowing to an idol. If it doesn't, then you're tolerating idolatry. And that's how subtle it is. And that's why God said, choose today. If serving the Lord is desirable to you, that's a good question. Because, yeah, serving the Lord's great if you are only looking at what you can get from him. But my God is a king. My God is a Lord. He has demands. And on top of it, my God is absolutely sovereign, which means he's got the final say on everything. And he doesn't do it my way. And his timing sucks. Okay? My friend and I always joke that whichever one of us leave this earth first, they're going to take the watch up and present it to God so he can understand what time is all about. <laughs> but God has the final say. I can't tell God what to do. And he's a God that can do something. <laughs> I have to laugh because I had so many people tell me, God would never do anything to hurt you. Mm -hmm. I, I always ask them, what God do you serve? Okay. I, I, ha I had a dear Catholic nurse uh, when I was getting phlebotomies all the time out of JFK. I was doing a um, 
what was it at the time? I think it was a three-week fast or four-week fast the Lord had asked me to do. Of course, she was concerned because you can't take a pint of blood out when you're fasting. You might faint, but I, you know, I said, go ahead anyway. I got enough in there. Um, but she said to me, she said, I don't believe that. I don't believe God would make you do something like that that could harm your body. I'm like, really? <laughs> what God are you serving? You know, people have told us, well, God would never put you in a position that, that puts you in danger. What a, thank you. What about the missionaries who are told to go overseas into Muslim countries, into Hindu countries, into places that are violently against the gospel of Jesus? What about Hudson Taylor and all the missionaries that God sent into China at a time when they were killing missionaries? God would never send you in a place that would hurt you? Of course he would. Because the souls of those men are more important than your life, which is going to be forever with him anyway. He knows what your life is. Okay? This is the God we serve. And Joshua places before the people of Israel, before he dies, a choice. And he says, understand all that God has done and all that you've been through. Okay? God didn't remind you of all the sin, nor did he remind you of all the difficulties. But you went 40 years in the desert, 40 years of eating nothing but this breadcrumbs, pretty much is what it was. That's it. And when God did give you a quail because you complained about it, you got a bellyache along with the quail. And many of you died. Okay? Remember who it is I'm calling you to serve. And you make the choice. If serving God, if serving Jehovah, if serving Yahweh isn't what you want, then don't make that choice. See, Joshua Joshua's as good of a salesman of the gospel as I am. Joshua told them, choose who you're going to serve today. But understand what it means to serve Jehovah. It is not just a, oh, well, you know, Sunday go to meeting. I can give, G I can give God my, my Sabbath day, but the rest of the week's mine. No. To serve God, to serve Jehovah, to serve Jesus means that he gets everything. And as concerns you, your time, the things that are valuable to you, your priorities, your life, your career, and everything else, you have no say in it anymore. It's all his. This is your Lord. This is your God. If you want to serve him, then you make that choice. But if not, then go pick whatever God you want. You have the gods of the Amorites. They're all around you. You got the gods of Egypt. You want to go back there and serve them? You got the gods of Abraham in Ur. You choose who you want to serve. But when you make that choice, you be faithful to that. And Joshua says, I don't care about the rest of you. As for me and my house, we've made that choice. And that's the context of what he's saying here. Yeah, that's a great thing to say, but Joshua is saying, understand what you say when you make that choice. When you say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord, you're saying, we're giving up all of our rights to everything because he is our Lord, he is our king, and we're going to do what he says. We will be his people. Yeah, that's a great thing, but that's kind of like, you know, that kind of goes along the lines of when people talk about forerunners. And they, they preach about forerunners and then say, who wants to be a forerunner? And everyone's like, yeah! I'm standing there in the back going, you're all a bunch of fools. You didn't hear what this, what this man just said about being a forerunner. You're cheering out of ignorance. And Joshua says, this is not a decision to make out of ignorance. Understand the decision you made. And again, what did Jesus say in Matthew? Count the cost. Only a fool starts to build a barn and doesn't see if he's got enough money to finish it. Only a foolish king sends his army into battle without start, without first finding out who the army is that's coming against him and does he have enough men to defeat them. Think about it. 
Look at what the situation is and count the cost. God doesn't want you to make a stupid decision out of emotions. And that's how we drive 99% of people to make a decision for Christ. We hype up their emotions and we say, now who wants to accept Jesus and not go to that horrible burning pit called hell? Well, I don't know about you. I don't want to burn for eternity. Yeah, I, I, want, I want the other side. But we never give them the full picture. And so they never make a full uh, a decision that's based on full knowledge and full disclosure. People have to understand you're giving up everything to follow Christ. Yeah, salvation is free to you. It costs God everything. It's free to you, but in order to live as part of God's kingdom, you have to give everything yeah. back to him. It costs you everything. It is an even exchange. He paid everything to make it possible for you to come to him. You give up everything to come to him. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we don't hear that taught. And that's, what, that's the gospel of the kingdom of God that Joshua presented to the people. Choose you today who you're going to serve. You've got a choice, and think about it. Verse 16, then the people answered, far, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. <laughs> be careful what you say. <laughs> Because, well, fortunately, we've all read the story. We know what comes after this. <laughs> it was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our forefathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. Boy, isn't that just like God? Choose who you're going to serve. We're going to serve your God. You're not able to serve me. You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has seen, after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is Joshua's giving them every chance. He's saying, we're, I'm, my family and I have made our decision. We're going to serve the Lord. And they say, yeah, we're going to serve the Lord too. You can't do this. Understand, you are going, you have the great capacity of failing at this. And God is a jealous God. God is a God who is holy. And if you sin just to the same degree that he was good to you, he will turn on you and utterly wipe you out. This is a both and God, not just the one or the other. Yes, God is love, but God is holy and God is jealous. Yes, God will bless you, but yes, God will also turn on you and curse you. You can't do this. That's not, that's not a, a negative statement on Joshua's part. Joshua is trying to get them to understand the fullness of this decision of, of what they're saying. And the people said, yes, we will we will serve God. Then Joshua said, you are a witness against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Okay? You said it. You've witnessed against yourself. You said that you're going to do this. I'm telling you, you can't. You said you're going to. You are a witness against yourself. Every time you look in your... And again, folks, understand, I'm not telling you don't make that commitment to the Lord. But like Joshua, I'm going to tell you, every time you look in that mirror, what you see is a witness against yourself. You made a commitment and a covenant with the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. You said it. I didn't make you. I didn't put a gun to your head and make you say it. You chose. You're a witness against yourself. You now are obligated to everything that God wants of you. Okay. 
And, and again, I'm not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to make this any easier than it is. This is serious. Because this is the God that we serve. Jehovah didn't suddenly abdicate his throne and put his nice loving son on it. <laughs> Jehovah is still God. Jesus is Jehovah. We still serve the same God the Israelites served. And he is still jealous and holy. And if you listen to what the prophets are saying, God is calling us back to holiness. And it's important for us to respond to him with that. Actually, there's a certain passage even in Jeremiah, like, like God is literally um, pleading with, with Judah. And then, you know, at that time, he's pleading with them to come back, actually. Mm -hmm. God, God, is a, God is a very, he's an amazing God. As angry as he gets with us, he still wants us. Yeah. Thank God for that. He, he's better than I am. <laughs> and the people said to Joshua, oh, no, "Then now then, said Joshua, verse 23, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a, larger, a large stone and set it up under the, oak, uh, under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your Lord. So Joshua says, you said it, and there's a stone that was right here when you said it. And he set that stone up by an oak tree, which was near where the, the tabernacle of the Lord was. And he said, this stone, every time you see this, is going to remind you of what you promised the Lord to do. Okay, that's why it's not, I hear people all the time, oh, well, I don't, I don't think Christians should have crosses. I don't think Christians should have crucifixes. But Jesus isn't on the cross. My mentor had a, had a little block cube that had a picture of Jesus on the cross, and he said, I look at that thing every day, and I'm reminded but that's where I need to be. Yes. I need to be crucified with Christ. Yes. It's a good thing to set up memorials to remind yes. ourselves of the commitments yes. we made to God. You know, I've had people that say, you think it's a good thing if I get a cross to wear? They say, oh, they say I, I don't want to wear it as a talisman of some kind, as some kind of special protection. I said, no. But I tell you what, you wear that cross around your neck throughout the day, you start thinking thoughts you shouldn't, yeah. that's going to get heavy and you're going to be reminded of the commitment you made to the Lord. You start, you know, you feel that underneath your shirt, you're going to be reminded of the commitment you made to the Lord. It's good to have those reminders. And because of the foolishness of our own flesh, we need those reminders. I have certain things set up around my desk where I study as reminders of commitments that I've made to the Lord. And I keep them there. My wife, she'll write scripture verses as the Lord, as the Lord lays something on her heart and deals with her with something. She'll write a scripture verse and you'll see that up on the wall or you know, somewhere in the house it'll be there. So that's a constant reminder of what the Lord had said to her. And that's we, we need those reminders, and that's what Joshua did. Um, verse 28, then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at, at Timnat Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Notice Israel served the Lord as long as there was a witness among them of people who had experienced. Okay. Experience isn't what we base our walk with the Lord on. 
That's a commitment to him. That's a decision. That's a choice. But we need the experiences of ourselves and others to maintain that. And when we have somebody who can say, no, wait, I remember I was there. I remember what God did for us. That's what we use the, the things of the past for. As long as they had that, they served the Lord. Uh, verse 32, And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that, Joseph, that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. <laughs> this became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. Now, that, that seems real random. Okay. Now we're at the end of Joshua, and they're talking about Joseph's bones. Mm -hmm. But what, what God wants us to remember is the faithfulness of his people and his faithfulness to his servant Joseph. Joseph was God's forerunner who left everything, lost everything, went to Egypt, and literally became as an Egyptian. Okay? And God promised him that because you gave it all up, you will still have your rest in the land that was promised you. And because of that promise, Joseph told the Israelites, he told his brothers and their families, when the time comes, because remember what God told our grandfather, great-grandfather Abraham, we're going to be here for a while. Okay, when the time comes and he takes you back, make sure that you tell your descendants after you to take my bones back and bury me there. And when they left, when they left Egypt, we remember reading that, that they took the bones of Joseph. Now God finishes that story of that promise to Joseph. And he was buried in the land that was given to his father Jacob to be buried in. You see, God always, always fulfills his promise. We don't have to be living here for him to fulfill it. He fulfilled his promise to Jacob, or to, to Joseph. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibna which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. So now Joshua's gone, Moses is gone, Aaron is gone, Aaron's son is gone. And you have the elders that outlived, and these are elders, so they're not going to be around much longer. Note when Scripture says elders, the word elders has the correct meaning, the older ones. Okay, the ones that God chose to lead and to rule his people weren't the 20-year-olds. Nothing wrong with being a 20-year-old, but you just don't have the experience. God places the responsibility of rule in the hands of those who are elder. Even in the church, the elders, the older ones in the faith are the ones who lead the church. Because they have more experience with the Lord. Okay? Now, when you have a church, you know, like Heidi Baker has, that is 90% children, some of them 100% children, because most of the older people died of AIDS, and these churches are being, these churches are being planted among the children that are collecting and living out of the garbage heaps. Well, who, who are the elders there? The ones who first came to the Lord have been raised up and have been walking with the Lord. They may still be young, but they've been walking with the Lord longer than the others. For God, experience with him is what gives you the right to rule. Not your knowledge, not your good looks, not your charisma, not the power that manifests through you, because the power that manifests through you as a believer isn't yours, it's Holy Spirit. And apart from Holy Spirit, you wouldn't have that power. And if you do, then it's not Holy Spirit. It's a false spirit, a demonic spirit. And you shouldn't be walking in that power anyway. Okay? So God, God calls his leadership out of those who have experience with him. So the elders of Israel were still alive. And they were 
they were going to be alive for a bit. So, where does that leave us? That leaves us without a Joshua, with some leaders and uh, and a whole lot of land that still needs to be conquered. So, at this point, okay, we have this land here in the pink that the people are settled in. Joshua is now gone. Now we have some things that happen in history, which are not recorded in Judges chapter 1. We actually have to go to Judges 17 now to catch the chronology. Joshua 17. These last uh, four chapters of Judges, I'm sorry, Judges 17, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> this is why I need y'all. Y'all look at me like, huh? Uh, Danny? Oh, yes. What's that? Why it's important? Uh, because Western, Western everything is messed up. I'm sorry. If we lived in the West, what happened was God started in the East. Okay, we had to, what we call in the West because, you know, we're kind of way over here and think ourselves superior. You know, the closest thing to us is the Near East. It's the East. It's where God started. In the East, there's a way of thinking. In the West, we got influenced by the Greeks. Now, not everything about the Greeks is bad and evil. I know there are people that say the Greeks are Greek philosophy, Greek understanding is all bad, evil, wicked of the Lord, of the devil, and you should never look at Greek. It's all about evil. If God didn't like some things about the Greeks, he wouldn't have used their language to write the New Testament. Okay. Yeah. For those who are just Hebrew, 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 everything, it's both. God is a God of both hands. Okay. We'll get off that dead horse. <laughs> but in the East, and this is how the Hebrew mindset works. This is how most of the Eastern mindset works. For the Greeks and for the Western mindset, we're very, very linear. Time looks like this. It has a starting point, and it goes somewhere. It goes from A to B to C to D. And it's linear, meaning when A is done, then it moves on to B. When B is done, it moves to C. When C is done, it moves to D. And there's a start and finish of everything. However, that's not how, that's not how the Eastern mind, it's not how the Hebrew mindset is, and it's really not how God's mindset is. This is a mindset that, that is warped. And this is from this mindset is where we get the mindset of hierarchy. The top down. You got top dog up here, and then you got underdog, and then you got subservient, and you got servant. And then you just got the plain old ordinary slob down here. It doesn't have anything at all. Okay? But let's look at this. Because, and, and people hate when I say this. But where does this kind of mindset come from? The demons are angels that rebelled against God. Angels are set up in an army. An army is set up the same way every army on earth is, rank and file. It is a hierarchy. Demons understand and think hierarchically. And so you have, you have all of these imps and minor demons that run around just causing problems. 
Then you have a higher level up and a higher level, and soon you get into a level called authorities. They have certain power over certain regions. You have rulers. You have principalities, which have much larger influence and power that, you know, such as the prince of Persia. He is a principality over the land of Persia. Then you have powers, and you finally work your way up to what we understand and call, though I don't know what God calls them, the archangels. And the Bible seems to indicate three of them. Um, you know, we don't really know a lot about them other than Michael we know is God's archangel over his land and over his people. But it's all hierarchical. Now, where do we see this played out? Well, we see it in, uh, in our companies. Uh, let's see, we go president, we go vice president, you know, and on down, we see it in our government. But then we have Okay, however you want to do that, whatever your church polity is, it's always hierarchical. And it always starts with this guy. And I'll tell you, this is totally unbiblical. And it comes from this linear mindset. Linear turn upside or sideways is hierarchical. That's not the way God works. Within the biblical, the Hebrew uh, mindset and the mindset of the East, it's what we call circular thinking. So you start with A, but A doesn't end. You go from A to A, B, and B includes everything within A, and then you go from A, B to A, B, C, so that everything within A and B is included within A, B, and C, and that's how God sees things, that's how the Hebrew mindset works, that's how every Asian mindset works, which is why you get into the workplace and you have Asians working with Westerners and you get a lot of clash, because Asians think in this way. You don't start at A and then finish A and go to B. As you start A, you go out and you include B in with A. A is included in B, and you think that way. And as we look at Scripture, that's exactly what we're seeing. We start with God created. But then God then created man. And God, in his rule, extended his rule over man. But man's rule was within God's rule. And then we see that Man rebelled, but the rebellion of man is still within God's rule. See, it never, nothing ever gets lost in this way of thinking. And that's, that's, how, that's why when we come to where we are today, everything that went before is still part of it. So you have, thinking of this, we have Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and by the time we get here, we have the New Testament. So everything within the Old Testament is part of the New Testament. You have what we call the church. And I try to refer frequently to the one new man. But it started in the Old Testament with Israel. The natural, the spiritual. It's all inclusive. It's not that, and this is where we go wrong in our theology, because we say, okay, God created, he had the nation of Israel, and then he gave up on Israel, and he started the church, or he stopped Israel, started the church, and he's going to take the church out, and then he's going to return to Israel. That's totally unbiblical theology. It's all inclusive, so that by the time... God gets to the church. He now has one new man, which is inclusive of both Gentile believers and Jewish believers. And all of them at one point is going to get raptured up to meet him in the air and come back with him to rule and reign with him on the earth. It's all going to be there. You can't exclude any of it. And so when we look at, <laughs> at this, when we come to this thing, what we have is... <laughs> Apostles, prophets, 
pastors, teachers, teachers, and evangelists. All of them exist. Don't let anybody ever tell you that any of these don't exist within the church today, or are, are not mentioned in the in the New Testament. I will grant it. The one that we put at the top is mentioned a whole one time in the New Testament. That's it. Which, which one? The pastor. Pastor. Oh, pastor. Pastor is only mentioned one time, and it's mentioned in Ephesians chapter four, where it talks about the fivefold ministry. The pastor is one part, and notice what the fivefold is. The fivefold isn't what rules the church. If you look in Acts, the apostles and the elders were the ones that the Lord used to steward his church, not rule the church. Nobody rules the church but Christ. Christ is the head. Christ uses the elders the same as he did in Israel. You notice he never changes. See, God is circular. What he starts, he never gets rid of. He keeps doing it that way. He uses the elders to administer his rule and reign within his local communities. Of those elders, there are those who have been given certain calls to minister to the body of Christ for the purpose of, this is not for us to make money off of. This is to lay, all five of these lay their lives down so that God can build his church up on them. They are the lowest of the church, not the highest. They are the ones that give everything so the church can grow. That's how we got... We got this from this linear thinking, but it's not God's way of doing it. God's way is this way. These are part of it, but they're the ones that are the basis. Christ is the foundation. On top of them comes this fivefold ministry that pours out and pours out and pours out and pours out. You know, these people often will talk about how tired they get. Well, of course, because they're pouring out and pouring out. The only reason they get exhausted it's because they keep the focus this way. Jesus is the foundation. They need to keep both focuses. They need to be pulling their strength and their understanding and their wisdom from Jesus and feeding that upward. They're just a conduit. And if they do that, the church will grow up. Okay. So what church operates like this? Uh, if you find it, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything close to it? I mean, I, I mean, I just... There are some there are some churches, some denominations that have caught some of it. Okay. So for example, the brethren. Okay. The brethren do not have pastors. The brethren have what's called a plurality of elders which means there is a group of elders that share the responsibility of the administration of the church and make the decisions accordingly. They share the responsibility of preaching and of teaching and of, of counseling and all of that. And that's probably the closest polity we call church government, church polity. That's probably the closest to New Testament church that we find today. And what would you say for for, for the Presbyterian Church because they're pretty like their name itself is pretty much elder and great but of course that could be that, that's a title but what would you say about the Presbyterian they, they still use the the pastor still the head they just call him the presbyter or the uh, the head elder but they still have that hierarchical view mm -hmm. unfortunately most denominations do and if they don't have pastor at the t well the pastor is the top of the local community and they may have elder boards, but most elder boards are under the pastor. And unfortunately, the way things work, you know, I've been around in enough churches, the elder boards may resist the pastor, but when the pastor puts his foot down, that's it. You know, <laughs> it's unfortunate, you know, but, but that's really what happens. And unfortunately, far too many churches, the pastor gets set up in a position where he has no accountability, 
He's got no one keeping a check on him, and that's why we see so many of them falling. You know, because they, they put themselves up, and the people put them up in a, on a pedestal in a place that they shouldn't be in. Okay, the pastor is meant to shepherd. The word for pastor is the word for shepherd. And that's what a pastor does. He shepherds or she shepherds because pastoring and shepherding has to do with nurturing, caring, growing, you know, loving. There is some feeding in there. It's all there. And women can do that far better than most of us men. Our idea of shepherding is, you know, Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know. For the guy they don't always give up they don't always teach, preach rather. God has given apostles, prophets, and teachers to teach. Past most pastors, there are a few pastors who are gifted as teachers as well. But not a lot of them. Yeah. Most people who are called to be a pastor are horrible teachers. And they shouldn't be up teaching. Mm -hmm. There should be teachers that are up teaching. There should be apostles that are explaining during the times when the, when the church comes together, explaining what the heart of God is for his people and where he's leading them. Prophets calling forth the will of God and the destinies over the people's lives and over the regions where they're at so that we can hear the word of God. The pastors simply take what the apostles and prophets and teachers are saying and encourage the flock to walk that way. And the evangelist is constantly in our midst saying, remember who your king is. See, this is where we got, We think evangelists go out in the world and win, bring in our numbers. The evangelists are meant for the body of Christ. They are part of the five-fold ministry. We boot them out of the body of Christ and send them out to bring numbers in. They're the salesmen of the church. That's not what the Holy Spirit intended them. The job of the evangelist is to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the people of the kingdom to remind them, just as Joshua and Moses did constantly, remember who God is. He is your king. You're not here just to live in a quote-unquote community. You are living as children and citizens of a kingdom, and God is your king. Remember that. And that's what the evangelist does. Now, when he gets out into the world, this is why Paul says, do the work of an evangelist, Timothy. Because, Timothy, as you're going into these cities that don't know God, what do you do? You preach the same message the evangelist is preaching in the body. God is a king. Jehovah is a king, and he's come to claim lordship over you. You need to bow your knee to the king who created you. That's the gospel message. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what Jesus says over and over again in Matthew. The gospel of the kingdom is what he talks about. And that is what the evangelist does within, within the church, is remind us we have a king. So also in Timothy, who are the deacons and the overseers? The deacons are the ones who, uh, that comes from Acts, where there were so many um, issues in the church. So where the deacons first rose up was when there were so many people in the church, there were widows and orphans and so on who the church was trying to take care of them. So the church would provide food for, for the widows and so on every day. And at, the, at one point, it was the apostles that were doing that. So they couldn't do it. So what they did was say, okay, I want all of you in, in the groups that are closest to you, pray and ask Holy Spirit for men who are who are outstanding and upstanding before the Lord, who will do this work for us so we can dedicate ourselves to prayer to hear what the Lord says. In other words, we need to do the work of the apostle. Right now we're doing a whole lot of other work that's pulling us away from being able to hear what God has for his new church. Let us get back to that. You pull out and give us 12 men who here in Jerusalem, I think it was 12, um, I, could have, I don't remember the exact number, who will take care of administering and making sure that all the widows get their fair share. Because what was happening is some of the widows were being overlooked. So when they pulled out those men and they, they recognized their call to this ministry, the Holy Spirit had called them out, they became the deaconos or the servants. And they administered the food to the, to the widows and later they took on other responsibilities. They basically um, 
as they were called, the Holy Spirit probably filled them with that gift of service. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. They served the church in those practical ways so that the apostles couldn't sit in their office and just make sermons all day. The apostles needed the time to hear from God <laughs> in a greater way. And so they said, give us people who will do the service, the work within your community so that we can dedicate our time to this. And that's where the idea of deacons came from. The elders were always the elders. And, and the word that you see in various translation, overseer, is elder. He is an overseer, which that word, if I remember correct, uh, uh, I think is the Greek word, um, it means an under-shepherd. So Jesus is the shepherd. The presbyters, the, 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 the um, overseers or the elders are under shepherds of Jesus. So they are just as much responsible before the Lord as the apostles were to hear what the Lord's saying. But the, the job of the elders was to, much like with the, the job of the elders in Israel, was to decide cases and decisions and disputes among God's people. And that's that's what the elders did. A, a question came up, an issue arose in the church. They didn't all run to Jerusalem all the time to go to mm -hmm. Peter and Paul and uh, Peter and, and John and Andrew and the rest of them. They went to the elders in their community and they said, we got a problem here. And the elders would take that before the Lord, discern from the Lord what his decision was, and they would bring that back to the church. And when the elders couldn't make that decision, the apostles who lived among them or came around to them would then sit with them and hear what was going on, and they would then make that decision along with the elders as to what the Lord was doing. So it's kind of the same setup that God told Moses through Jethro to do. Choose for yourself people that are over tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and so on, and they will be the ones who will decide <laughs> the smaller cases for you. And anything that can't get, can't be decided up through that rank of, of eldership will then come to you and you make that decision. And that's really what the elders are. They're the overseers. They oversee what's going on and make sure that it stays in line with the word of God. And that's their purpose. Um, and they really are the ones, that's why I said the, the, uh, the Brethren Church actually has it, has it right. They are the ones who, who lead the church. And there's a plurality. There's never just one. Okay, and, that, and that's important. Okay, so did that answer the various questions? Do you think when the Lord starts moving like he wants to move through his people, as the prophets as the prophets are saying, do you think this hierarchy in the church will get rearranged? Absolutely. One of the things the prophets started saying last year. Uh, probably about two thirds of the way through. I'm sorry. Um, they started hearing the Lord say, "The day of the one man show is over," and God is going to break that. And, and that's one of the reasons why, again, I, I believe what we're doing in February is important because it's preparing all of us to be a part of the church. Because when God says, this is not me, this was you, this was your idea, this was your program, not mine, I'm bringing it back to my program. We are going to, we're going to have to be ready for that. Yes. You know, and I've heard people for the last, how long have we been moving among charismatic circles now? About 10, 15 years, yeah. In these last years that we've been moving among the charismatic circles, we've heard people God's going to change this. We're, we're going to see change in the church, and we're not going to be like the old way it was. And I, I listened to the people saying that, and it basically was, we don't like who's in power now, so we're going to get rid of them so we can be the ones in power. Mm -hmm. And it was, how many of you have read Tale of Two Cities? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, you know, read the whole thing, but the, the key point is that very last chapter mm -hmm. where in the French Revolution you have... Madame Defarge and all of those who started the revolution, who take King Louis and, and the Queen and all of those aristocrats, cut their heads off and destroy them because they didn't like the way they were doing it. 
but they set themselves up in that position. Well, the ones who were under them, and, and, and as, as Dickens ends the story, he has the, uh, what is that called, the protagonist, the hero? Yeah. He has him going to the guillotine. He says, I see an empty chair where Madame Defarge is and where Jacques is, and they are the ones that are going to the guillotine, and there's a new set of people that are raising them up. And that's really what I've heard from people. We don't like the way it's run because we think we can do it better. But now God is coming and God is saying, I don't like the way it's done and it's going to be done my way or the highway. And it's going to cause, I, this is the thing we have to understand. When God starts moving, there is going to be an, a, an, a horrible civil war in the church. The church is going to split in half. Those that want to follow what the Lord is leading, those who want to embrace where God is taking, those who want to hold on to the old vanguard. And, and they're going to find those holding on to the old vanguard are going to find themselves fighting God. Is that what where the great falling away? It's that's that's part of what we're in now, which is why God's going to restore the way it should be. Because the more we have followed in our own understanding, in our own program, the further and further we've gotten away from, from God. And I want to, that concept right there, this is a good transition. That concept is why this next section in Judges chapter, starting in 17 is so important for us to grasp in this day, in, in this time where we're at right now. So in Judges 17, and I'm going to leave this up here because we need to point out a few things. Verse 1, now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. So we have this man Micah in the hill country of Ephraim. The hill country of Ephraim is this area right here. So in the in this In this area of Ephraim, let's get this accurate. Benjamin wouldn't like that I took some of his land. Now note, Ephraim extends into all of this, but this was unconquered. There were still Canaanites living in that part of the land. In this area, there was a man named Micah. And Micah goes to his mother one day and says, Hey, Mom, I heard you curse about somebody stole, how much was it? 1,100. 1,100 shekels. That's a lot of silver. 1,100 shekels of silver. Well, guess what? I took it. I stole from my own mother. Okay? Now, notice... Remember the timing of this. Joshua has just died. And the people have not fully conquered all the land yet. That's the time setting of this story. Then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. Okay, now let's face it. This is a very carnal family. Okay. The mother loses her money. She gets upset and curses. The son said, I took it from you. She said, God bless you for being a thief. <laughs> okay, so we already know where the heart. And again, remember the time. This is right after Joshua died. This was not soon, long, this was not long after the people of Israel as a whole vowed once more and covenanted to follow the Lord their God. Then he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, and she said, Sol I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord, okay, to Jehovah. I'm giving my money that I got returned to Jehovah for my son to make a carved image and cast an idol. I will give it back to you. That short of time... What's that? 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Understand, these, these are the people that God said, you're a stiff-necked people. I spoke to you in my own voice the, first, the Ten Commandments. And the first was, love the Lord. You will not have any other gods before you. You will not set up an idol. And within less than two days, my servant was on the mountain. You didn't see him and you built an idol. Now Joshua has just called the people at Shechem. Now notice where Ephraim is. Shechem is right on the border of Ephraim and Manasseh. The temple, the tabernacle of the Lord is right here. Micah lived somewhere around here, not a long distance to go. And yet his mother said, you took this, so I'm giving it to you to create an idol for me. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're good. You're good. I, 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 I repent, and about 10 minutes later, I'm jumping right back in. <laughs> Our heart gets real cold. And, and that's even more scary. Here, at least, the tabernacle was probably about uh, five, six, maybe 10 miles. We have Holy Spirit and God living right in us all the time, and yet we are just as quick to sin against Him. Yeah, okay. Just in case self righteousness rises up and we all want to condemn Mike and his mother. <laughs> so he returned, verse 4, he, he returned the silver to his mother, and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith, who made them into the, imi uh, the image and the idol. And they were put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine. And he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. Yeah, okay. Now remember the time period. This was less than a year or so from when the three, the three tribes returned to their land and set up an altar as a memorial and as a witness, and Israel sent people out to destroy them for setting up an altar. Here's a man in the hill country that sets up a shrine, idols, and installs his own priest, and then mimics the tabernacle of God and creates his own ephod, meaning that he was making, he was appointing his son high priest. Okay, does this kind of sound familiar? We call it democracy, and we vote in who's supposed to be in charge of the big body of Christ. And that. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> now this man, Mike. Okay, um, in those days, Israel had no king. Everybody did as he saw fit. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna read that phrase over and over and over in Judges. And the reason why Holy Spirit repeats that over and over again, okay, NIV says, did as they saw fit. I kind of like the King, King James translation. They did what was right in their own eyes. Beautiful King James. Now, why do I like that? Because that matches with what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to avoid. Do not lean on your own understanding. And what they did here, what God is showing in the book of Judges is the depth of sin in the heart of man. Because remember, sin... Is not all the little things we do wrong, those are sins. Sins, plural, according to 1 John chapter 2, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. In God's eyes, this isn't even a question anymore. Jesus obliterated this. This is gone from God's eyes. 
Okay, he died for the sins of the whole world. What we are judged on is how does judges pull out in our heart? Sin. Sin is the understanding that I have a life apart from God. <laughs> In other words, there's part of my life that I don't need God for. There's part of my life that I can do on my own, in my own understanding. This is what we're judged on. In other words, you're saying there's part of my life that I just make my own decisions. Mm -hmm. I don't go to God in that. Yes. That's breaking it down. And why is this sin? This is the reality of sin because God is Lord. He is absolute sovereign. And therefore, for me to say that there's any part of my life that I don't need him for is absolute treachery in the eyes of God. we got to look at sin as what it is. And when you understand the reality of this, it, it should make you sick. And yet, we find ourselves every day right in the midst of the book of Judges thinking that there's something that I can do on my own. I can do my job on my own. What do I need God that for that? Well, like a friend of mine says, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know? This is in the time after, right after Joshua died. It, 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 uh, yeah, we're going to get to that. It, it, it's not... Yeah, that's... That is a literary writing of, of a narrative. Because if you look in, if you look in, um, from, from, we're going to get to the context of that. That's coming up. In the next chapter, we're going to see that this all ties in together. Um, we're coming to it. I knew you were going to ask that because I just, I just read this before I came here and I'm like, hey, wait a second, did I get this wrong? Um, if you do go back to Judges chapter 2, you're going to see that it talks about now Joshua had, Joshua had sent the people home. Or jo Joshua 1 starts that way. Joshua 2, you come to a passage that says, now Joshua had, Joshua had died. But between 1 and that passage and 2, there are a whole lot of things that happened, which pretty much describes most of the book. So you have some summary passages and some flipping back and forth giving context to the immediate uh, thing that the, the writer of Judges is getting to. So, okay. Going back to sins and sins, like, huh. I feel like praying um, like a really, really deep does, it just changes everything, like the mindset of how you talk to everyone, or like, what you tell people about sins, like how to see sins and also like when murder happens, or like these important decisions, or talking to people at church. It, it, the Lord actually had me sit with Walter for almost three years just for that old man to beat this into my head. And then it took at least five or six years after that for Holy Spirit to really get me to grasp the fullness of the reality of this in my own life. Folks, this goes deep. It really does. This is the reason why murders happen. Because I do it in my own understanding. This is the reason why sins occur in my life and why I have to take 1 John chapter 9 where it says that if I confess my not sin, and I began to notice after the Lord put this understanding in me, he actually uses two different words when he talks in Scripture. He does say sin, and then he says sins. And 1 John 1, 9 says that if, if we commit sins, we confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, our sins is a manifestation of the depth of... Pressure. 
sin within us. And this concept of sin is that battle between the flesh, the, the, the old man, the sin nature that Paul talks about in Romans, and the new man, the spirit that God has, has put within us. When we understand this concept, Romans 5, 6, and 7, and 8 make a whole lot more sense. Well, yeah, the physical Sins are simply the symptom or manifestation that this exists. Yes, absolutely. Uh, could you read? I, mean, I can't read what you wrote. The understanding that the, the I, understanding that I have a life apart from God. Apart from yeah. God. Yes, my French teacher told me that I was going to become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not for nothing, but I admire nurses tremendously because they're the only people. Do you all get a course in doctor's handwriting? Because you all can read it. I don't know how you can do that. But. Okay, so this is important to understand because this is what's going on in Judges. God now is taking us from salvation to working out our salvation. The nation of Israel has been saved, redeemed, and brought into their new life. You see the analogy? You see the same way that God works in the New Testament. Now God is showing what it means to work out that salvation. And the way he begins to show that is to show the depth of this rebellious nature within the people of Israel, the natural people of Israel, which is analogous to the depth of this nature within each one of us. That's why the book of Judges is so important. This is not a time to be self-righteous and point fingers at Israel. This is a time to be introspect and say, if Israel did this, how much more am I doing it? Israel did this when God's presence was in Shechem. In the middle of this territory, I'm doing it when God's presence is right in, in my heart, right in my spirit, right within me. They went to the Ark of the Covenant. I am the Ark of the Covenant. How much more despicable is this fact? Okay, we gotta be we gotta be harsh on ourselves because remember what Joshua said: you serve a holy God, and He is jealous. And now Jesus stands on the other side of the cross and says, and he lives in you. That jealous holy God lives in you. And to not understand the depths of this in yourself is foolishness. Okay? We got to grasp that. And that's what we're that's what we're seeing in Judges. So <laughs> let's try to answer my daughter's question before we go home tonight. <laughs> Uh, verse 7, a young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, <coughs> left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in, in, Ju in Judah. <coughs> he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Then Micah, okay, then Micah installed the priest, or installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. Okay, do you see the heart of sin? Okay, now, two things. Actually, Bob, I mean, this kind of told me that, that this family they didn't even bother reading the law of Moses whatsoever. He, they just... Or they read it, or it, didn't, it did or not sink into yeah, their sink heart. In there. But look at this. So you have down around here, I believe, is Bethlehem in Judah. This Levite was assigned to Bethlehem. But he wasn't happy in Bethlehem. He left Bethlehem and started wandering around until he came up to Micah's place in Ephraim. 
Why? Because in Bethlehem, he was just one of the Levites. Wasn't enough for him. He had to live off of sacrifices from the tabernacle. Okay? In other words, when you served, you went up and you got your portion from the tabernacle. That's a long way to go to get your food. Now, you were given some land to grow some food in the meantime, because God doesn't want his priests to starve. But he wasn't happy with that. So he left the place that God had given him. No, this is the priest. This is the Levite. Okay? Notice what the Levite did. He left the place that God had given him in order to find something better. So he comes up and he finds Micah. Now Micah, wow, he's an Israelite and he's got his own temple. I'm a priest. I got to share my service with all the other priests and I don't even get to serve in the best place. Here's a man who's got his own temple and he's got his own ephod. Only the high priest can wear the ephod. I can wear my own ephod. I get what's left of the sacrifices. This man's going to give me 10 shekels and a shirt every year. And if you've never heard that message by Paris Reedhead, 10 shekels and a shirt, look it up online. Listen to it. And it probably is going to come out in this week's email to those going on the retreat. What is it? Ten Shekels and a Shirt by Paris Reedhead. R E I D. Paris. H E A D. How do you spell his last name? Reedhead. R R E I D H E A D. He was a missionary to Africa that the Lord dealt with, but he had he he preached a message on this. Ten what? Ten Shekels and a Shirt. Micah offered him offered him something that he wanted. Position, power, provision, everything that he would want. And he's like, this is perfect. And so Micah, okay, God, by nature of the family that he was born into, had made him a Levite. The inheritance of the Levite was their privilege to serve the Lord in his tabernacle. That wasn't enough for this Levite. He would rather have a position as priest to a false god in a false temple. And so a man made him priest. God made him a servant of his. A man made him a priest. Wow. Okay. Notice the difference between the two. But this Levite wasn't happy with what God gave him. Now you heard me stress that several times. What happens when we become discontented with what God gives us? We go out and search the world for something the world can give us. And we don't see how subtle that is. When we become discontent with the blessings of God, we always go out and search the world for something better. And I can promise you, you will never find anything better than the blessings that God has appointed to you. Yeah. Wow. Twice it says this young man was a young man, a young man. And because he was a Levite, is he automatically a priest? He is automatically a Levite. Only the only right. the family of Aaron are priests. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so he served in the temple of God. He had the privilege of being able to go and be and live among the presence of God all the time. So he could he could literally go up here to Shechem and just stay there as a Levite. And tend the tend the courts, and the depending on which uh, which family of the Levites he was in would determine what part of the temple and tabernacle he was able to be in charge of. 
But so he was automatically a priest? No, he was, was no, no. He had to be born in order to be a priest, which meant that they entered in to give the sacrifices. You had to be born in the family of Aaron. Mm -hmm. Oh, Aaron. Okay. Yeah. That's why it's called the Aaronic priesthood. Okay. <laughs> but he wasn't satisfied with what God wanted. Or so what Michael God had. just automatically made him a priest, even though it was... Micah so made him a priest. Yeah. Why? Because, oh, Micah's own understanding. God uses Levites in his temple. So God just, God sent me a Levite to put in my temple. I'm going to be blessed by God. You know how often Christians talk that way? Because something happens that appears to be good and ties into something they heard in Scripture. Oh, this is God. God gave me this job because I was praying for it. Are you sure about that? Because I know a devil who can hear every one of your prayers. And if he can mess you up by bringing a job offer that is beautiful to you and get you a tie, they don't do any of that stuff. They're just living their lives. They're working hard. They're pouring out everything they can into making money. They got a house. They got food. They got land. They got a dog. They got a picket fence. They got children. They got everything that I don't have. God must be blessing them. And folks, not to be crude, but you all know my initials. Okay. And I, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what it is. It is spiritual manure. And we fall for it. Just because somebody is experiencing material blessings does not indicate all the time that the blessings are coming from God. We have an enemy who will bless you out your wazoo in order to keep you from being in the will of God. And if you haven't heard from God specifically that that is what he wants for you, don't move until you do. This is why the Lord says, learn to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. We don't want to wait because we're always in a ridiculous hurry to get where we shouldn't be. God wants us to wait because he is a God of timing. He is the sovereign Lord and he alone knows exactly when you need what you're asking for and what he wants to give you. And if you're wise and wait, years down the road, you're going to look back and say, oh, now I see what God was doing in that time. But it's not easy to wait. Why? Because the first thing the enemy throws up at you is you ain't getting any older, any younger, honey. The clock is a ticking. You're going to be dead before you get to see any of the blessings of the Lord. How many have heard that? How many have heard it? Okay. Don't you be foolish. How many years do you think you got? You long outlived your youth from this, honey. The young generation's coming in. You know what? If God has a position, a job, a land, a house, a blessing of any kind for you, he will give that to you, and he will, just like Caleb, give you the full strength, ability, wherewithal to handle the blessing that he gave you. Yes. Let's not fall for the lie of the enemy that will make us walk into sin like this Levite did. Now, let's... This, did Micah take his son out? He's still there, but now he has his son, who is a, pre, a priest, and now he's got a Levite. Now his temple is... Okay, now this is the key. This is why he says, now the Lord will be good to me. Because originally all I had was my son. But now I got Levi. Okay. We had a good ministry. But we just had a bunch of nobodies. We did this all on our own because we thought it was a good idea. But now God sent us a prophet. We got a prophet in our ministry. God's going to bless our ministry. I'm just trying to pull it down into modern day reality, folks. There's a lot of prophets for hire. And that's what this Levite was. He was a Levite for hire. He was looking for something more than what God had for him. And there's a lot of them out there. Don't be fooled just because they come to you and offer their services. Now, to answer Pedro's question, 
chapter 18. In those days Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites were seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Okay, so this is how we know that it was at this time because the Danites were given this territory. That was the territory that was given to Dan. <coughs> Can you all see that? Oh, there we go. <laughs> now can you all see that? Okay. So they were given this territory. However, if you look at where the pink is, the part of this territory that was conquered, that itty bitty piece right there. So they had all of this, all of this land that was still unconquered. All of that land, and, and when we read elsewhere, we'll read that the, the Philistines and Canaanites of this area, this is the valley, this is the plains, this is the hill country. The, the Canaanites and, and um, the Philistines of the valley would not let them conquer them. In other words, they put up a fight. So Dan was in a difficult situation. They had this amount of land to live in, and they had a big fight ahead of them. And so they got discouraged and said, this is too hard for us. What land is that? What's that? What land is that? Okay. Uh, that's the tribe, that's the land given to the tribe of Dan, which is from the lower part of the hill country of Ephraim out into um, uh, out to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's, this is all part of Israel. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Golan is, I believe, up in here somewhere. Yeah, if around, I remember right. It's, it's around by Galilee. The sea yeah, of Galilee. yeah that, that would be where Golan is. But I don't remember if it's here or which side this is on. I, I actually saw that on one of my maps earlier. Uh, okay. So that, because we know that, because of this description, Tejo, is why we know it's in this time period and not in the later time period than that. So they were still, they still hadn't settled. Okay. So uh, the Danites, uh, verse 2, sent five warriors from Zohar and Esh Eshtaol, to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all their clans, and they told them, go and explore the, the land. So the men entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah, where they spent the night. Okay, so now they send out men from here to explore the land. They don't want their land. Okay, notice what's going on here. What God gave us, we don't want. And so they go to explore the land to find somewhere better than what God gave them. Listen to how we say that. To find something better than what God gave you. And as they go, they come up here and they happen to run into Micah and his house. And they spend the night there and hear all about what's going on at that house. Verse 3, when they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, who brought you here? And what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? Now that tells me that this young Levite left Bethlehem and came right up through Dan to go up into Ephraim. Because these men recognized his voice. They had talked to him before. And the priest answered them. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, he told them, verse 4, what Micah had done to him and said, he has hired me and I am his priest. Okay, notice I go from becoming a Levite of God to becoming the priest of a man. So I'm not working for God anymore. I'm working for a man for 10 shekels and a shirt. You notice how low you've fallen. 
<coughs> then they said to him, please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. Okay? Here it is. The, the heart of the Danites. <laughs> they already know. God said, do not set up an altar to to outside of my altar do not worship any other gods they come here it's a levite because it's a levite serving in another temple that has idols installed in it the damnites say inquire of the lord just because he's a levite just because He's a Christian, and he has a prophetic ministry. We go and say, inquire of the Lord. Doesn't always mean he's going to be inquiring of the Lord. I can guarantee you this Levite did not inquire of Jehovah because he's abandoned Jehovah. Wow. And the priest answered him, go in peace. Your journey has the Lord's approval. Okay. <laughs> and yet just because we get a word of prophecy from somebody who calls himself a prophet we say God told us this this is why the Old New Testament says test every word of prophecy test it just because it came out of a mouth of somebody who claims to be a prophet of the Lord doesn't mean he is and it is Okay. test every word of prophecy so the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety, like the Sidonians, unsuspecting and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relations with, uh, with anyone else. So when they returned to Zoar and Eshtal, their brothers asked them, how did you find things? They answered, come on. Let's attack them. We have seen that the land is very good. Aren't you, going, uh, aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. And when you get there, you'll find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing, whatever. Okay, so let's get our context again geographically. They started from here where God gave them because they weren't happy with what God gave them. They left, met Micah's guy, who gave them a false sense of hope and says, God's with you. They left and they traveled up to Laish. Laish is up here beyond Naphtali. That's how far they traveled. And up here, they found a group of people, an area of land, very, very rich land, very, uh, you know, it, it had everything that was needed. And the people were living securely, and they were unsuspecting. The people felt good about it, and the people lived far from the Sidonian. Now, the si Sidon was up in this area. So Sidon was far enough away that these people couldn't call the Sidonians to come down and help them. That's what they're talking about there. So they were unprotected, unsuspected, living in comfort and security in a land that was easy to take, and it was very lush and rich and prosperous. So obviously, this good bargain's got to be from God. What are you waiting for? Go do it and go take it. Do you hear this all through it? It sounds good. It sounds real good. But it's not God. Just because it sounds good doesn't mean it's God. Okay, let's go on. They, verse 11. Then 600 men from the clan of the Danites armed for battle set out from Zohar and Eshtal. On their way, they set up camp near Kiriat the Arim in Judah. So they are going somewhere. For some reason, they're going this way or that way. <laughs> Either that or... I'll have to find out where Zohar is. Uh... This is why the place west of Kiriat Yarim is called 
the Mahanan Dan, which means Dan's camp, to this day. From there, they went on to the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. Okay, now we have an army coming to Micah's house. <laughs> then the five men who had spied out the land at Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that one of these houses has an ephod, other, uh, other household gods, and carved images, and a cast idol? Now you, now you know what to do. So they turned in there and went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted him. 600 Danites, armed for battle, stood at the entrance of the gate. A little intimidating. Mm -hmm. The five men who had spied out the land went inside and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the cast idol, while the priest and 600 armed men stood at the entrance of the gate. Okay? Priest for hire. Better deal comes along. <coughs> When these men went into Micah's house and took the carved images, the ephod, and the other household gods, and the cast idols, and the priest said to them, what are you doing? They answered, be quiet, don't say a word. Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and a clan in Israel as priests rather than just one man's household? Better deal. More pay. Raise. Promotion. <laughs> but is it of God? Mm, yeah. See, we always look at blessing as coming from God. Yeah. Not always. Yeah. Then the priest was glad. Hey, God heard my prayers. Praise God. He took the ephod and the other household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. Putting their, little uh, putting their little children, their livestock, and their possessions in front of them, they turned away and left. When they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men who lived near Micah were called together and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, What's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, You took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else ha do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? <clears throat> the Danites answered, don't argue with us or some hot-tempered young men will attack you and you and your family will lose their lives. So the Danites went their way and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. <laughs> okay. Didn't take very much. Okay, we got 600 men here. Shut up, or there's a few hot-tempered guys among us that are going to come beat the crap out of you. Okay? What good did doing it in his own understanding get him? He lost it all. And in the end, if you want to live by this, I don't care how much blessing you think you're going to receive, you will lose it all. Because there comes a time when God puts all we do to the test of fire. And that which is wood, hay, and stubble gets burned. That which is gold, silver, and precious stone remains. Doing it God's way will always remain. It may not be the easiest. Then they, the Danites, verse 27, took what Micah had made and his priest and went on to Laish against a peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relations with anyone else. The city was near the valley, uh, was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites built the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their forefather Dan, who was born <coughs> uh, to Israel though the city used to be called Laish. There the Danites set up for themselves the idol, Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons uh, were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idols Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. They weren't happy with what God gave them. So they went looking for something better. What happened? 
they knew they were going a long way from the house of God, from the tabernacle. So if I'm going that far, I don't want to come back down here all the time. I now have my own Levite, my own idols. I'm taking them with me. And so this area up in here, we will see later, became known as Dan. They forsook the inheritance of the Lord to get something for themselves that came easy. The inheritance of the Lord was difficult to get. Okay, I want you to hear what I'm saying. The inheritance of the Lord was difficult to obtain. So they left that because it was too hard, and they went and found an inheritance of their own. And it says that from that day forward, Dan lived here, and they worshipped the idols that they brought from Micah's place. Now, that doesn't sound so bad, but I want you to notice something. Go back in the Old Testament and search out Dan. From Judges, clear through chronologically till after the return, of, till after Christ sets up his throne in Jerusalem, till the new Jerusalem is established, which is Ezekiel, I think 42. Chronologically, but in the Old Testament, clear up through the New Testament, and I thank Cindy for pointing this out to me, Dan is never again mentioned as a tribe of Israel. Mm -hmm. The only time you see it mentioned is as a border. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, it says from Dan to Beersheba, which is the border, the borders of Israel at that time. Why? Because what did God say? If you turn from me and worship idols, I will utterly disown you from my people. And if you look at Revelation chapter 11, was it? where it talks about God marking the 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe, Dan is not, not listed there. Dan was the first to be attacked by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and taken into captivity. Why? Because they forsook God and God forsook them. And Dan never returned from captivity. You hear people today talk about the lost tribe of Israel? That's Dan. Okay, now when I realized this, I started thinking, because you got a lot of people saying, we're the lost tribe of Israel. Uh, you can have that title. Because the reason the lost tribe of Israel was lost is because they forsook their God. And they followed idols, and they never turned back. See, when you become dissatisfied with the inheritance and the blessing of God and go search for your own, you have taken the step to turn your back on God and God will turn his back on you. You've signed your death now in the spirit. Be careful about grumbling about God's inheritance and blessing for you. God never said it would be easy. He just said it would be a blessing. Dan was meant to go trust what the Lord said. What did God say? You go and I will drive them out for you. They kept trying to go in their own strength to drive out the people of the valley, of the plains. And it failed because they were doing it in their own understanding and their own strength. If they would have done exactly, and they should have learned from Joshua, right? Jericho, do what God said. AI, do it in my own understanding. Get my butt kicked, come back and do it the way God said. And I conquered it. And every land, Gibeon, do it my way, my understanding. I got compromise, but I made an oath. I'm stuck with the compromise. Do it God's way. He brings out the kings. He brings out, he arranges the battles. He destroys them for me. And he conquers all of this land. Do it God's way, and it ain't going to be easy, but when you consult him and you do it the way he said, you will walk into the fullness of your blessing. Before, before those sections were made and everything like that, and, and Dan was Dan, and 
came from was me from then, you know, we were going to withdraw. Didn't Dan do something really dastardly? This, this is it right here. Well, prior to this, because I remember a hundred years ago reading that, and it never left me. And I thought, oh my God, he's like thrown out of, um, you know, what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you mean Dan, Dan himself? Dan, Dan. Uh, right that could be. I'd have to go back into Genesis and check yeah, that out. Yeah, I looked a few it, times yeah, to find it, out. It, it could be. It had something to do with um, a woman or yeah, women. Or, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, I do. I think some. Um, I, I'll have to look that up and see. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good question. Is that the form where the, a woman was abused and then they, you know, at the end? It had to stop. Yeah. Oh, no, that's them. coming up. That's that's the next chapter. <laughs> we'll get into that next week. Um, but one of the things I want you to notice, though, even though God disowned them for his plan of redemption, when it's all said and done, when the new Jerusalem gets installed, Dan is still, Dan is restored to Israel because Dan is given, when God comes back to rule and reign with the new Jerusalem, Israel isn't divided like this. Israel's divided like this. And the 12 tribes each have a slice of land that goes from the sea over. And it's all evenly divided, and Dan has a portion of that time. God's a softy. He's not a softy, but he is. He remembers his covenants to his people. Uh, okay. 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 He's merciful. Okay. I've seen a couple of maps, and, and I'm and like for the past couple of years, I've been seeing a couple of maps that I see Dan there and Dan up there. I'm like, why is it like that? Yeah. Until now. This it is their appointed land. Yeah. This is what they this, chose. This is what they chose for years. So, this is why I keep stressing. If you want to know what to do, you got to get in the presence of the Lord and ask Him. And when He tells you, do it. That's where the blessing lies. Okay? So, we will pick up here next week and keep going. Excuse me, where Revelation 2 mentioned uh, about Dan the Five? Uh, seven. Seven and eight. Yeah. Seven and eight? And eight. Uh, it was the. Revelation. Chapter 7, verse uh, from verse 5 down through verse 8. That's where the 12 tribes of Israel are marked, 12,000 from each tribe, and Dan is not in that list. Thank you. And it's kind of interesting, too, because Dan and Ephraim are right next to each other. E even Ephraim is not on the list, but it's been replaced with Joseph. Right, right. Ephraim was Joseph's son. And later, Ephraim actually absorbed no, you walked in right. We just had a, a question. You didn't mention anything. About the retreat. Uh, just, just that I'll be sending out emails okay. in the in the next week, and to be praying for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oops, I never ended that.